Okay. So this is actually the most important part. So I, I really want to walk you through uh, the studies. I'm going to walk you quickly through the community studies, uh, but let me remind you where we left off. And if you remember, I told you that we have to do uh, interventions in community, interventions in clinical care, and uh, patient-provider interaction. So let me move you quickly to interventions in community, because this is something that we're moving a lot. Basically, one of the things we find uh, is that for elders, uh, we find that, you know, PCPs, uh, primary care providers, tend to not really give elders that much except pharmacotherapy. Uh, they typically, uh, if people look confused uh, or if they look depressed, uh, they tend to attribute it to grief or bereavement. And many times the anxiety is not considered serious enough. So it's what people call the fallacy of good reasons of why elders should be depressed or anxious. Next. That's one of the reasons we decided to go with this intervention. It's called Positive Mind, Strong Bodies. It's an intervention that we do in community to provide a disability prevention treatment in actually community-based organizations that mostly serve racial and ethnic minorities. So what we did is we identified those community agencies that actually see our elders, especially our uh, elders, ethnic and racial or immigrant elders. Next. One of the reasons that we were so interested in this topic, actually this study started because people were saying, we don't have a good interventions for minority elders. We still don't. There are very, very few interventions. And we know that because of immigration, the patient, the patient population of elders that are immigrants is escalating very quickly. Many of these elders we know because of their ling linguistic uh, competencies, uh, are lacking in terms of the continuum of care. And so we wanted to do an intervention that's done by community health workers that are trained. And this community health workers is a way to shrink personal shortages. It's a way of addressing the lack of bilingual, bicultural clinicians. And it's a way of trying to work on how to reduce an, uh, anxiety and depression sy symptoms, which are two of the most disabling conditions. Next, what we know is that, you know, there is ageism in our population. And the same thing we talked about, you know, discrimination, ageism is terrible. And um, I, I mean, I experienced this taking my stepfather to care. There's really a huge triple stigma of if you're a minority of being old and then of having mental health problems, it's really, really very hard to get care. And uh, lack of transportation and uh, children that, that are uh, responsible for the elder working makes it extremely hard. So here is a change of what we did. Next. What we did is this community health worker study uh, where we train community health workers that are in actually in those same community-based organizations. They might have no experience in clinical care. They might not really have ever uh, done psychosocial treatments, but we work with them to offer them this care supervised by clinicians, licensed clinicians and psychiatrists that meet with them once a week either in group or individual supervision to make sure that they're uh, doing exactly the work that it's a manualized treatment. But this community health workers can connect people to healthcare. They really have been shown to do because they know the community, know the population, can really do the treatment in someone that looks like you, talks like you, and can really respond to your needs. Let me show you an example of what we're doing. Next. Uh, we know that behavioral health, uh, this is something that people don't know, but actually one of the things we have been seeing is how behavioral health in minority elders is one of the things more related to mortality. We know that uh, one in five older adults has one psychiatric or substance use uh, condition, 
And actually in the populations where we're actually screening right now of elders, we're finding it's more like 30%. One in three are having some sort of psychiatric condition that would benefit from treatment. Next. This study is called Positive Mind, Strong Bodies, and it's, like I said, a disability prevention that's given in four languages. We do it in uh, Mandarin, Cantonese, Spanish, and English. It's a six, a six months uh, intervention intent to treat, and what we're trying to lower is uh, self-reported disability, disability days, and mood symptoms. And it, it's really showing a lot of promise. We actually just got refunded uh, with our renewal to actually implement it in, in more settings, this intervention. Let me show you what we found. The intervention is a fairly straightforward intervention. We try to do interventions that could be really easily adopted in the community. It's 10 uh, sessions of manualized CVT. It is based on a previous intervention that showed uh, very good results with Latino immigrants. But we adapted this in intervention for African Americans and Chinese elders. We did a lot of work. We actually just published uh, a paper on the adaptation that we did to change it for um, African American and and, uh, China and Chinese elders. And then we also did the strong bodies, which is uh, invest, which is 36 sessions of exercise over 12 weeks. And this is really by given by exercise trainers, but Many, we couldn't find exercise trainers that spoke Chinese, uh, both Mandarin or Cantonese, or even Spanish speaking trainers. We had difficulty identifying them. So we actually trained people in this community based organizations to provide the intervention. Next. What you can see here, it was 307 total participants randomized to intervention and control. And you can see here, most of the participants were 75 plus. So this is an intervention that could help very elderly patients. Uh, most of them were uh, actually female. We also found that the race ethnicity, as you can see there, uh, we had a lot of uh, Asian and Latino participants, uh, a lot of people that had a high school diploma or more. And most of them, around 70%, were born outside of the US. So this is a population that we definitely wanted to uh, approach because they rarely get services. Next. This is uh, the instrument that we use is late life functioning and disability. And this is an instrument that uh, refers to disability. It's an individual individual's ability to do certain actions like stepping on or off a bus or being able to walk certain distances. And so let me show you what we found. You can see here the top is actually the group with the intervention at six months and then at 12 months. And you can see the effect was sustained uh, in comparison to the uh, control group where higher score are better. And people, what they told us is they really, really liked the intervention and it really improved uh, in terms of their functioning component. Let me show you the next one, which is the WH, the World Health Organization Disability Assessment. And this is difficulty going about in your daily activities, like taking care of your household responsibilities. And I'm going to show you the next results. And again, we saw a difference here in terms of higher scores are worse. And you can see here that the actual control group was getting worse, while the um, the intervention group uh, was getting uh, better, but then you know it, it became bigger, the difference between the intervention and control group at 12 months. Next. The, the final one is the Hopkins symptom checklist, and I wanna show you this is an inventory of symptoms of anxiety and depression, and it asks you about, you know, have you been bothered or distressed by different symptoms of anxiety and depression? Next, and again, you'll see 
the same thing. We, we were able to find a difference across the groups. Remember that this is a prevention intervention. So we include people from mild to severe symptoms. And so what we found now is that we actually um, are, are doing the same study, but people want it more after the six months intervention. So we're creating what's called a maintenance group. Let me go to the next. Overall, if you look at the um, range of the effect sizes, we're finding that it's uh, like a moderate range that we can get for some of the effects. And now we enhance the intervention to try to make it even stronger for the depression and anxiety symptoms, uh, adding other components to the intervention. And that's the one that we're testing right now. Next. What we did, and I, I want to emphasize this, is that uh, we are changing the paradigm. Uh, rather than people finding treatment, we go and find them. So we actually do the screener in this community-based organizations and try to identify who are the people that are going to benefit. Instead of people uh, trying to prove that they want to come, we actually accommodate and try to invite them allowing them to engage. We do a lot of engagement, including motivational interviewing to try to get them the importance of keeping themselves and then in, in shape. And then we talk to them a lot about giving them choices. For example, we allow them to do the sessions in 30 minutes or an hour. We allow them the time where they can have the session. And then the other thing is we really help them understand the process of disease and uh, how they can, they have to take a self-care plan if they're gonna make a difference. Let me go next to a different one. I'm gonna tell, tell you about photo stories because this is with youth. And I think this is an interesting component because it's a totally different study of where we started and where we ended. Next. This is, uh, we wanted to understand why youth were having such tremendous uh, problems in terms of uh, mental health uh, in these four communities that are uh, satellite communities of Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, and so we decided that really to understand what was going on in the, um, in the youth behavioral uh, brief inventory of problems, rather than actually assume what was happening to kids, we were gonna tr really try to find out from kids what was happening to them, how they saw the problem, and what type of intervention they wanted to actually work on their problem. Let me go next. So we use photo boys. I don't know how many people in the group have uh, seen a, a photo boys, but it's a, a way of people identifying, representing, and uh, really enhancing their community through photographic techniques. It gives you an idea that youth can then present photos to capture how they're feeling and what they're thinking, and then do narratives that really promote a critical dialogue with the research group and also with the youth themselves. Next. The structure of the project, it was a three-year project funded by the WT Grant Foundation. They, they actually fund this type of very, uh, I would say, not typical studies. It was actually uh, uh, in the first uh, year and a half, we did the Youth Photo Boys project. Uh, it's, it's actually with 80 youth that we did this project. It involved four trainings for the youth to use Photo Boys. And then we each group in each of the trainings took 10 pictures across each of the four communities. Uh, we did it in Charleston, East Boston, Chelsea, and Revere. And then we presented to each of the communities uh, the results of the youth. They were a chance to discuss it in community forums and key interviews. And then we developed the intervention with the youth based on what they told us they wanted. Let me show you next what we found. The conceptual model, I want to also describe conceptual models because I think this is very useful for people that are thinking about doing studies. 
we really were looking at majority minority status based on another study that we have done and how experiences of inclusion and inclusion uh, can really make a difference in how you feel about your neighborhood. And then how those experiences lead to individual behaviors, cognitions, and emotions that put you at risk for behavioral health symptoms. So that's the model we were using. That's why we were focusing so much on neighborhoods. Next. Um, the first thing we did is we asked them to tell us about this community. And this is an example of how with a captive description of the youth, you can get so much. These are youth that immediately, immediately talk about segregation. And this is in Charlestown. And this is an area that's very, very small. It's only 1.4 square miles. And even then, kids really, really identified the segregation and how certain upper class people could live in places like Newton and Mission and African Americans would live in the projects. And then they really saw how different people identify themselves. So they talk in Charleston, the projects and Mission, there's been fights, like literal fighting just because they think they're better than the project. And that was captured just in one of these photo uh, voice uh, star stories. Let me go to the next to show you a second one. This is a different one, but people felt uh, in terms of this is feeling included or excluded. And what you, a uh, uh, 15 year old male, Latino male talked about is that there had been a hotel that was built in Chelsea and he said, everyone in Chelsea is like family. And just seeing someone you don't know and haven't seen before, it just makes you feel weird. It's like 50-50 anger and confused. Why would they build a hotel in Chelsea? Why can't they use the money for something that would benefit the city? Chelsea is mostly a Hispanic Latino community. And then once you implement that hotel, there's many white Americans coming in. It was just the experience of how the money was invested in terms of gentrification, but how this really later on, uh, kids will talk a lot about, about gentrification, having their families move out of Chelsea because they couldn't keep affording Chelsea. Next. I wanna show you how in the community forums, I'm not gonna spend too much time here, but people had great ideas in the community forums of how to deal with the neighborhood problems that the youth were identifying and given solutions as here in Revere, like how kids could apply for grants to clean the city or how they could create a vocational center so kids could learn about life skills and do different activities. So this community forums is a way to build momentum in the community about what needs to be done. Let me show you a different one. This one is East Boston, and this is again the same thing. The, they brought the problems that they were having, and then the community forums uh, really came up with the solutions, like how to use organizations in school that are socially active to help with trash or laws to help uh, residents against rising costs. Actually, the group, I'm gonna show you later on uh, what happened. But what happened, one of the groups in East Boston decided to do a video uh, that we're getting permission from their parents to be able to show. That would be one of the videos I would love to show. They did a video of uh, how the a rising cost of housing in East Boston was having a terrible impact on youth because they were losing their ties as, as the, the affordability in East Boston of housing made it very hard for uh, staying in East Boston. Next. What we ended up, we saw, I, I wanna use this example because I wanted to show you how we started a project that we thought was gonna be on youth civic engagement and leadership and uh, uh, actually on mental health. And the youth said, no, 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 no. Don't blame us. The problems we're having are problems because the society that we live, the neighborhood we live, is really uh, not helping us thrive. So rather than do a study uh, or a program that is for mental health, we don't want a program for mental health. We want a program that really helps us solve the, the problems we have in our neighborhoods that affect us. 
So we ended up, we, we actually have ended up developing a program with youth as co-researchers. That's a youth civic engagement and leadership. One that really looks at youth development and leadership that really looks at the political education and awareness that youth should have today that builds skills and capacity to do a power analysis and action movement. And this is what I'm saying about moving to where people want to go rather than where we want them to go. We were framing it as a problem of the youth and intervening with them directly, and they're seeing it as very different. Next. I want to finalize today with giving you some ideas of what we have learned about improving client and client provider interactions, because I really think this is an area where we could do so much more. Next. You know, we did a study where we videotaped uh, 129 patients with their providers for a first interview. And what we really learned, we learned so much from that project is videotapes of a first interview of a mental or a, a mental health or substance treatment visit. And what we learn is that, you know, we really have to expand the capacity of uh, clinicians to reflect on how they're acting or interacting with their clients, especially of different cultures, how they actually are operating on um, automatic pilot in a way that doesn't allow them to recognize that they're creating a lot of assumptions and not really trying to understand where that person is and what matters most to that person. One of the things we notice, and this is something for all of you clinicians, when you're surprised about what someone, a client of you comes through the door, it means that you were already making an attribution that was probably incorrect. So this is an important area. What surprises you about the client? And that's what we wanted to try to do in the next uh, intervention that I'm gonna talk about. Next. One of the things we have found in after doing that study is that we really need a paradigmatic shift in the clinical encounter. Partly it is that we're reproducing the power imbalance that we have in our society in that clinical environment where we actually, typically the clinician is from the majority group or has a well position and the client, especially the clients we are working are mostly poor, uh, might not speak the language of the clinician and are typically non-white. And there's uh, some evidence, in fact, we're finishing a paper showing that the more there's a difference between the clinician and the patient, the less, the more likely the clinician is going to dismiss that patient from what they're saying and not pay too much attention. So the more uh, synchronicity there is between that patient and the clinician, the more likely you can get a, a good connection uh, in the in, in the clinical interaction. So one of the things I'm going to be talking about is how can you change that clinical environment. Next. The first thing we did is a study with patients where we actually trained patients to ask more questions about their provider. And it's really only uh, you have a care manager that trains the patients on 45 minutes about three sessions of how can you do a better job when you advocate for yourself in the clinical environment. This is what we call the DECIDA study. And the only thing you're training that patient is how to ask questions about what matters to them and what they want to solve in the clinical environment. Let me go to the next one to show you. The training, the first training is just brainstorming questions and then prioritizing questions and how you have to learn about open and close-ended questions because they'll leave you to different uh, types of uh, trainings, uh, answers. And then in the training two, we talk about whether you do the question as a who, a how, or a why, because it'll give you different types of answers. And in training three, we help you with self-management of your illness. So the more you know about your illness, the better equipped you are to ask questions and also to ask for information about how to take self-care. Next. 
And what we found is we could do a really, really good job in actually in activating the patient to ask questions after those trainings compared to the control group and to do a better self-management. Uh, it was really surprising for Latinos and Asians that tend to be fairly pa passive in the clinical encounter. But what was really interesting in this study is that providers were not happy about the intervention. They really disliked the intervention. It, they said that it took a lot more time to talk to their patients, that their patients were asking questions like their diagnosis, that, that uh, not necessarily they wanted to give to the, the patient, and also that the uh, patients were asking in, uh, about questions that they didn't have to answer themselves. So it put the uh, providers in a difficult situation. Next. So how do you make a collaborative relationship with providers that have not had that experience in clinical practice? How can you facilitate a better relationship between the patient and the provider uh, and achieve a collaborative dialogue on their conditions of unequal power? So that's what we did in this next, uh, next uh, slide. I'm going to show you. We look at, you know, there's been really good, uh, great data showing how you can use uh, shared decision making uh, to actually help the collaboration and deliberation by doing the team talk that you support the patient and making and, and finding out choices, the option talk of weighting those choices, and the decision talk of how to make a come to a decision in what they want out of that. Uh, session and we do it session by session, by the way. Next. Uh, this is the uh, revised free talk model by Elwin. I'm not going to cover it. So next, I, I want to just move on to show you. We did the shared decision making with the providers and patients. This was a study where we randomized providers and patients to a four arm randomized trial. In the first arm, both the provider and the patient were trained. In the second arm, only the provider was trained, but not the patient. In the third arm, the patient was trained, but not the provider. And in the last arm, none were, were trained. And what we did is we trained providers in a three-part training on how to do a better job in five areas. Jenny, if you pass to the next one, I'll show you what it is. We think that to really change this collaborative uh, relation, you need to focus not only on the clinical aspects, but on the relational variables like warmth and trust to have a better connection with the uh, diverse clients and that you need to focus on four areas, attributional errors, problems in communication, the limited uh, patient or client activation, because we don't want a lot of uh, questions from the, our uh, clients. And then how to create more attention to the qualitative preferences and shared decision making. Let me go next. So one of the things I wanna uh, discuss is the importance of perspective taking, empathy and understanding. And, and when one of the things we teach in this training is cognitive empathy. You might not feel any empathy for that person. In fact, you might dislike the patient and we dislike patients, believe it or not. As they come into the door, we make very, very quick decisions whether we like them or not. And so cognitive empathy is finding enough about the patient that you consciously and actively try to understand and it's not rooted on our emotional reactivity. It's really at the cognitive level that we connect to what is the life of that person? Why are they reacting that way? Why are they acting that way? So it's not just taking their perspective, but it's actually getting their perspective. Next. One of the things is this is an area that there's actually quite very good data showing that it lowers uh, because people start attributing to that person self descriptors of that they have, the other one becomes more self-like, like you. And that's a way to then start uh, attributing more positive things to someone that you don't like. So this is really an important aspect, doing perspective taking because it affects the relationship with the other. 
Next. The other thing is perspective taking helps us uh, take away stereotypes. We know that the more we learn about someone, the more it reduces the amount of stereotypes we make of people. And that adopting the perspective shows that it, it really enforces bonds with that person. Next. The other thing we need to take care of is that in our everyday experiences, we tend to uh, draw conclusions from our beliefs and jump a lot of the levels that we need to analyze because we feel like some someone has we have this belief this person is lazy or this person is that way and we jump to conclusions without really filtering the data to see if our data is correct next this is attributional errors it's one of the uh key parts that we taught people how we feel in information, especially when someone from another culture or other group comes, and we have a very short uh, session with that person, we tend to put a lot of information in, in the gaps. This is especially true when the person is acting in a way that contradicts how we interpret their nonverbal behavior. So the more we cannot uh, actually judge the nonverbal behavior, uh, the more we will attribute different things that are errors. Next. And uh, we tend to do this particularly where people are from an outgroup. We tend, what we mean by an outgroup is someone that we don't consider like in our community, our group of people. So in the outgroups, we tend to say that most of the behavior has to do with their traits. And for the in-group, we tend to say it's more situational. You know, like uh, in Puerto Rico, we have a saying that the bus left you instead of saying you were not there to take the bus on time. So that's the difference between you being late because you're, you're not paying attention and attribute it to the person and saying it's situational. So the bus left me. That's an example of uh, how you can make it a situational thing. Next. Bias is another form that's very important. And one of the things that we use in this training is how to show you how your bias in your attention to people. Next, Jenny. Um, and the Harvard University project that people have probably seen has done a lot on, on implicit bias. Uh, this just shows you how challenging is implicit bias because with everything we know, uh, we even know that around 54% uh, of people still uh, prefer white people in comparison to black people that even today we still do this implicit bias of judging people differently based on their skin uh, and that they're really openly biased attitudes that affect how we behave with our clients next and i mean you know i think one of the things why we did this study based on audio tapes so the way we did it is for every client after we trained the provider we actually, one of the things we did is we audio taped their sessions and someone blind to intervention or control condition in both the patient and the provider would then uh, code the tapes because providers have, they might feel that they're not being biased and patients might feel their providers are not being biased. But what we looked is to how in a train, uh, train coders did without knowing whether we saw those behaviors. Next. This is what they did. They actually did shared decision making and then coded how that provider was doing in terms of shared decision making and the other areas that we talked, attributional errors and whatever. And they coded and gave a score and we obviously double coded and, and uh, found reliability. Next. And then we gave each of the providers that were participating in the trial, how they were doing in shared decision making and perspective taking and engagement, attributional errors and so forth, their strengths. 
where they were doing average and where there were areas of improvement. Next. What we found is providers that received the training were significantly more likely to demonstrate shared decision making according to the blind coder. The patient or the provider didn't identify that they were doing more shared decision making, and I'm happy to dis discuss this, which was quite interesting. And then we find that the patients and providers that participated in, in the combined study were more likely to say that they got quality care, evaluating their, their care as better. So it means that we need both, both the trained provider and the trained patient to have a better quality care. Next. Um, we got good retention of the clinicians. Clinicians really like being trained because the program is tailored to them and the clients also, we had high retention rates. It's interesting that at the beginning, clinicians don't think they need the training. Uh, but one of the things we did learn from this training, it's really, really hard to change clinician behavior. Super, super hard. It takes a lot of practice to incorporate the strategies. And it's important um, to have clinicians see how their patients are responding to integrate this practice. Next. Um, I'm, I want to end this presentation because I want to make sure we have a lot more time, but I want to give you five things we learned of what really made for a good collaborative relation between the patient and the provider. One of the things we found that really made a big difference was having this chair agenda. The people that really emphasize a chair agenda, and it doesn't have to be a chair agenda only about treatment. It could be about when their appointment is gonna be given. It could be on what they're gonna prioritize in that treatment session. That makes a big difference. The other difference we found is balancing who has the floor. We find that some providers hijack the whole session and almost don't, don't let the patient talk. And the same way we find some patients hijack the whole session and the provider lets them talk, we found that when both of those things happen, it was not a good outcome. The third thing that was really strange, because this is not something that we typically are uh, trained on, had to do with tentativeness in presenting the recommendations. Rather than saying you should do this and that, we actually we found that when providers were tentative on what they were recommending, maybe this will work for you, I don't know, or we would like to see if this might be something you want to try. That worked actually in patients being more willing to adopt what the provider was saying. The other one was collaborative meeting making, sort of you create uh, actually with the uh, patient, what are the meaningful things that they want to address in that session? So we, we actually train our providers to use a lot of us, we together, uh, in the clinical encounter because it's a co-creation of what the session is going to be and you're given responsibility to the patient or client for doing the work. And then all, always in every session, we identify uh, the tasks that matter most to the patient. And they might change from session to session as people are becoming more insightful and better aligned to what the problem definition is but we co-construct the what matters most to that patient. We really think this community-based interventions and focus on the client-provider interaction need to be very tailored. Uh, we need to co-create what we're doing with our uh, patients and clients. We need to address not only what they're bringing to the um, actual clinic visit, but actually we're now putting more care managers to help us with what's happening in their community challenges. And then we need to really try to see how we reach the people that are not coming to clinic. I think one of the biggest mistakes we have in mental health is we only concentrate on what we call good clients, clients that are adherent, that come to care, that you don't have to call, that don't miss appointments, 
And that's not necessarily the people that need it most. That's why we disseminate information and practice them as part of the whole process. And I want to thank everyone for being so patient. First, thank you, Dr. Alegria, for your presentation. I had a question with the current COVID pandemic. How have you adapted or thought of adapting uh, these interventions, especially given the disparities in technology and internet uh, among elders in particular? So actually, we're going to go forward uh, in doing the Positive Mind Strong Bodies virtually. So let me tell you what we're doing, Juan. We're actually uh, buying tablets uh, that we are going to deliver to the actual elders participating in our study. We've actually uh, created uh, some of the assessments. They're all virtual now. Uh, we are hoping to do the assessments uh, and the uh, screening, the screening by phone, uh, and then the actual for people that are eligible, uh, we're going to do the baselines and doing the actual both trainings, both the uh, exercise training and the psychosocial training by Zoom. Uh, we're going to, for those people that have computers, we are uh, going, if they don't have Wi Fi, we're going to get them plans that are cheap. Uh, plans and for those that uh, you know we're buying the tablets for those that don't even have computers we have actually started pilot testing the whole intervention uh, we already uh, give people when we deliver that package that includes the invest with which is a best with uh, weights and the computer in a package with a, a actual um, depending on your language, we give you a workbook. And that workbook walks you through everything visually, and then also you will have this Zoom. Uh, right now we're doing another study virtually, and it has worked extremely, extremely well. Uh, so we, we're hoping that it will work well for uh, elders too. Thank you very much for that. I look, well, I look forward to reading it and then even learning more about it as well. <laughs> sure. I think the IRB has been a problem. So let me tell you, it's not like trivial. We've had to create a lot of uh, different IRB processes to explain uh, how we would do it and how we will uh, create safety and also to our data safety and monitoring board that we will have a very careful way of uh, identifying people. We also have a flagging system that we use one to, to make sure that if people are not doing well, we can quickly then uh, try to uh, escalate what we will be doing with the elders. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Okay. Thank you, Juan. Um, so now we got a question from Wendy. Yeah, I think she's saying, um, let me see if I hear it. Uh, I'm reading. I love the change of paradigm where clients guide clinicians. I suspect that even more for minorities, having a say and direction of what they need in the community is much more inviting and inclusive. Absolutely. You know, it was fascinating to talk to the clinicians uh, and how they felt like, for example, one clinician had been telling this uh, patient that she was depressed, but she was not doing all of the things like exercise and trying to uh, do uh, things that were pleasurable for her and so forth. And when she changed the narrative of how she was asking the person how to, what would work for her? What are activities that would work for her? She came with a very different reaction of the patient uh, being resistant and saying, no, that's not going to work for me. I tried it before. So how you approach made a huge difference in how uh, the clients felt about the whole encounter and being more empowered to, to make a say on how they wanted uh, to be treated as the expert in their illness. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I've worked in a shelter uh, before as well. And then uh, it reminded me of one moment that was so powerful when I was talking about self-care. And then this woman looked at me and she says, are you kidding me? This is what you came to talk to me when I need to get a job. 
this is what I came here. I thought you were going to get me a job. And it was, I will never forget because of course self-care is important for all of us. But if I didn't have that understanding of her actual needs, she needed to abandon the shelter. She was there for a limited time. And then of course that was one of her most immediate needs for her and her family. Yeah. So, you know, that communication of, of, of understanding what is really what uh, what will improve their quality of life versus what I think as clinician they need. So I really yeah. love that change of paradigm. Yeah, and you know, uh, when the, I did, before I did uh, behavioral health, I did a lot of work on HIV. And I remen remember doing um, a big study on uh, a big uh, intervention on trying to improve uh, HIV prevention for sex workers. And they taught me so much. It's one of the studies that I, I will always keep in my mind because I, I went there to supposedly teach them about um, how to protect themselves from HIV. And they <laughs> taught me that's not really the big issue. <laughs> Try to help us change uh, in terms of getting new jobs, exactly. Uh, Self-protection from the violence that we experience from actually from the police force. Uh, try to help us, in, you know, get uh, housing that accepts people that have a track record uh, with the, uh, the justice system. And and it was eye opening. After that, I did a different intervention. <laughs> I decided HIV was not what they needed. It was more social determinants of health. And I confronted exactly all of the problems they were saying. Uh, very much so. It was uh, we wrote about how hard it was for them to get the resources they needed. So it was a learning uh, process. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for coming to present to us in Cincinnati. We really appreciate it, and we appreciate that uh, Jenny is there with you, taking the work that we've done here and expanding it. We're really appreciative. Absolutely. Um, I loved hearing about the work that you guys are doing up there, and I it was especially heartened to see the emphasis on community partnered work, um, that the voice of the youth was guiding the work that uh, community health workers were used in the, the work with elders. I was this, it's a little bit of a technical question because uh, we we really try to use um, community based participatory research in our approaches here. And sometimes I would say decreasingly so, but sometimes the the challenge that we have is people say, OK, well, if you're developing um, an intervention with Latino immigrants in a non traditional destination area like Cincinnati, how does that really generalize to anywhere else? If you're sharing decision making with community partners, it doesn't the tailoring is so much that it doesn't um, it, it, who cares for if it's anywhere else? Have you dealt with that kind of challenge? And if so, how have you responded? My God, all the time. I'm sorry <laughs> to say you, Farah. I mean, even from when we started the end last studies uh, and we wanted to just talk about Latinas, people felt, well, how does this generalize, you know, in comparison to whites? If you can't present another group in comparison, there's there's uh, what are we learning? And and even when we do work uh, with uh, different groups, uh, people say the same thing. Well, this is this doesn't it's not necessarily the same if you do it in Massachusetts that if you do it in Arizona or if you do it in Florida. One of the things we are doing and maybe you can do this, Farah, is we're trying to do it in more sites. So one of the things we tried to do for our interventions, uh, like the positive mind, strong bodies, we did at four sites. And that was really helpful because people could say, well, you know, these groups are not necessarily the same, but we could say, actually, it did seem to work quite well in four different sites. And that was more important than actually saying um, it worked for Latinos, Asians, and um, Blacks in, in our study. Um, now, however, National Institute of Aging uh, is saying exactly what you are saying. How can we make sure that this works for all the groups? Uh, I think that's a very, very interesting demand that they're putting on, on us because you don't hear the same demand of uh, white participants. You right. never hear um, like, 
you know, a, a white person in Alaska is going to be very similar to a white person in New York. <laughs> and, and that's an issue. Uh, or even, you know, in the same way that uh, whites could be immigrants uh, coming from Russia or from another place, and they could, it could not work exactly the same. So you don't get the same standard, I'll say. Right. So beyond ranting about this, I could say that the way we've come uh, through it has been insane. Uh, not everything is going to be generalizable necessarily, but it's a start and we, we talk a lot about if it works here, we have more chances that it will work elsewhere. But the other, if you are able to do it, we, we have done now more studies in collaboration. This is one thing that Jenny can talk about, but for example, we're doing things. We did a study in Puerto Ricans in New York and Puerto Rico, and I, I have the same problem there. A lot of people say, well, this is only Puerto Ricans. How do you know it's going to be generalizable to Cubans, to Mexicans, and so forth? So now we're st doing a similar study in Indiana with Mexicans. But what I would say is um, I would not let you that deter you because um, if not, we, we wouldn't have anything. We basically wouldn't have anything, and it's an unfair standard. Thank you. That's super cool. Thank you, Rebecca. And then Farah, the professor of psychology at, at the University of Cincinnati, and she's also a co-founder of UCLA. Uh, she has done amazing work with the Latino community here, um, and she was recognized also by the a former governor of Ohio. Um, so let's see. And I see uh, the chat getting active with more people. And I know, and I know a lot of people in the chat, but not everybody. So if you can, for a second, say um, you're. Well, I'm going to say your name, but if you can say, like, where are you showing us from and what's your role? So, Perla, I'm going to give you the mic now. Sure. Um, greetings, Dr. Alegria and Dr. Spinola. I am from Puerto Rico. Uh -huh. I'm actually a community health worker right now for the Puerto Rico side, for the Positive Minds from Bodies project. And I want to give a little bit of insight that even in the same place, like we're talking about disparities in the U.S. that are a little bit more pronounced than in Puerto Rico. But here in Puerto Rico, I'm still being confronted and really, really challenged when with my participants in the Positive Mind Strong Bodies because we are from different, let's say, social classes and seeing so much, so much need in my own country that maybe I wasn't being aware of, really, it has been really a challenge. And it, it gives us a little bit of more experience and understanding of the real needs of our own, com um, the people that live in our own country. <laughs> so it has been really, really, really an amazing experience to be a community health worker and to see like in the front line, the health disparities, even in the same country and with the people that share your language and your um, skin color, then maybe you wouldn't think of it. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Perla, because I think that's such an important uh, area, the class differences that we don't talk too much about, because you could actually, even in the clinical encounter, this issue about class, uh, can make a huge gap between the client and the uh, actual either community health worker or a clinician. So I'm glad that you raise it that sometimes we even within the same uh, ethnic racial background, there can be uh, a class divide that makes it so much harder. And I agree. I think clinicians. Um, I wish we were more outside and meet people where they live. You know, I, I a, a long time ago when I started, I used to visit people for testing um, both our interventions and our surveys. And, and one of the things I, I really will never forget is opening, uh, asking the person if I could have water and they told me, yes, go ahead. And finding that the uh, refrigerator was almost completely empty. And it just, it's like exactly what you're say, saying, Perla. It just changes, you, you, you then realize you've been living in a bubble. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we have another question coming from Dana Rush, and I'm going to give you the mic, Dana. 
Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Maggie. Hi, Dana. So <laughs> glad to see you. Dana was, oh my God, Dana, I am thrilled. I'm so happy to be here. Um, what a wonderful presentation. Um, I just wanted, my question was kind of related to your photo voice youth empowerment project and, and your work with community health workers and how we might bridge the two. You know, I think that youth are powerful change makers within their communities. We certainly see that in the activism world. Do you have any advice of how we can kind of blend those two to really elevate the role of youth um, in yeah. communities, particularly within undocumented communities, mixed status families and, um, and the like? Love to yeah, I, I think your point is a fantastic, Dana, because I think one of the things we found in this youth project is the importance of having adults, uh, and this could be community health workers, that would support the youth. Because one of the things that we're finding in the first uh, pilot that we did on uh, this, uh, it was a very small pilot of uh, civic engagement and civic leadership. But I can tell you one of the things that was overwhelming for youth is the responsibility of uh, being the activist and how that really takes a toll. Uh, if you're trying to change your community and, and you're trying to uh, be you know, an advocate for the changes needed. So I think that the community health worker, like you're saying, could be a great bridge to support the youth in institutionalizing and actually facilitating some of the uh, bridges with powerful people and with uh, strategies so that they could be even more effective in what they're doing. So yes, absolutely, we added that component. Uh, we didn't add it uh, interestingly with community health worker, we added it with uh, volunteers from the community that we would pay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it's great seeing you. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you that Dana is like, I'm a fan of Dana's work. Uh, this is where your uh, mentees become like even much, much better than you ever were. And so Dana is one of them. Jenny is another. <laughs> you lie, but thank you for that, Maggie. <laughs> no, no, no. Dana, you're an assistant professor right in Chicago. You're the director of the center for immigrant mental health? Yes. Um, yes, I'm part of um, a coalition here in Chicago and I, I kind of created and direct um, the Immigrant Family Mental Health Advocacy Program at our institute um, at UIC. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have, we're gonna go to Julia Robin. Uh, her question was, what would you say is the largest challenge you have faced so far to training providers in shared decision making and cultural humility? Yeah, I, I would say there are two big challenges that I would say are the biggest. One is time. It's very, very hard uh, to get time of providers. Uh, they feel very busy and they feel uh, you know, that mostly they don't need it. So, so I would say time. And the way we were able to incentivize providers to participate in the training is we gave them 20 hours of continuing education. So we pass our actual program through uh, the boards. So we pass it through psychology, social work, and psychiatry. And we were able to give them 20 credits of continuing education. That was very helpful. I would say the second one um, had to do with how intense is the uh, for for people to really change for providers to change, they need to practice this quite a bit. Meaning they need to do six tapes and get feedback for the tapes, and then uh, actually be able to integrate what you're teaching them in their next tape and so forth. So it requires a lot of cognitive bandwidth while they're trying to make these changes. So it means that providers have to now go to a session and rather than work in automatic pilot, really think what they learn and write and try to implement them. So we give them a list of like, these are the things that are important for improving and then following that, and we see that it they do, but it's hard to, to keep that cognitive bandwidth during those six sessions so it becomes part of their everyday. 
So that's the second one. Thank you for that question because it's really important. Thank you. I see Rebecca Castellanos. Good morning, Rebecca. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Um, so I think I have kind of more of a general question. I um, did my dissertation on how to culturally adapt uh, mindfulness-based interventions uh, for Hispanic and Latino populations. And I'm kind of like at a point where I have some good data and I am in a primarily clinical position um, and um, kind of a little stuck in terms of how to move forward with, and this might be more relevant to the next part of uh, the talk, um, but um, but any thoughts on moving forward with kind of more of a intervention um, measure development kind of research program would be really helpful. Absolutely. So two things that I will say, uh, Rebecca, if you email, uh, email me, uh, we'll send you a, a paper we just got accepted on the adaptation of the positive mind strong bodies. Mm -hmm. And we can also send you a paper we got accepted for uh, IDEA, which is a, uh, an intervention uh, for immigrants. So okay. there is a need of that type of publication. It had it wasn't difficult to publish any of those two papers. Um, it just you have to find the right journal mm -hmm. to try to get them in. So that's the first thing. Uh, actually, uh, Irene Falgas, who is uh, one of our uh, one of our staff, she is actually getting that's sort of how she's building her niche about doing adaptations. It's going to be something up and coming that requires uh, everyone to do adaptations and they're not done very well. So you could probably make your career out of that and also adaptations for measures. We are writing a lot of work on measurement invariants to try to see how measures work for different populations. Uh, we just submitted a paper by Mario Cruz in our staff and submitted two papers on um, on instruments that we tested for different groups and how they didn't work the same way for Latinos or for Asians. Happy to send you all of those uh, articles. I think if I were you, I would go to something like National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities that's interested in adaptations and interested in uh, measurement. I think you're going to confront more difficulty if you go to the other typical uh, agencies who mm -hmm. don't seem to be so interested in either the importance of measurement or in the importance of adaptations. Last thing I'll say is. You might want to try philanthropy, like the WT Grant Foundation is very interested in, in measurement, uh, especially with regards to disparities. And the same thing for uh, Robert Wood Johnson. And you might try it also philanthropy like Bank of America, uh, because some of these things, it's hard to get them through an NIH committee. I hope that helps. Yes, yeah. that is wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. And Rebecca is a postdoctoral fellow in behavioral medicine at the Medical University of South Carolina. So what he says, how do you deal with publisher restrictions for studying already published translations that may be problematic? Yeah, we've confronted the issue of translations, um, partly because some of the actually uh, standard translations don't work for our populations, actually we have so many stories i could we could write a book about it uh, wendy so one of the things is we communicate with the actual uh for some we had communicated directly with a person running the the actual instrument the author and i can tell you we haven't been very successful in changing authors from the translation but then we have been able to publish with data showing why the translations, for example, we have, we find, uh, to give you a, a, an example, double negatives uh, don't work with Latinos for some reason. Um, they basically do poorly on those items and we showed, and for example, for one of our papers, we show it, it didn't only was Latinos in, in, uh, in Massachusetts, but it actually was Latinos in Spain also had the same uh, problem. 
So that helped us take out what we do in cer certain is we take out those items and sometimes we leave them and then we recalibrate the scale without those items. Uh, and in some we've had added items to try to substitute for those items in the actual um, standardization and then publish that it's a modified version of the measure. Yeah, so um, this is exactly my research because I, I, I am doing a concentration in forensic psychology. And then when I started to notice is my clients were getting so confused with the majority of tests. And so this led me to do a huge discovery, which is the horrific ways that they translate it. And I will say it like that because it's called the direct translations. And then not only that, but they continue to use norms for English norms. So um, one, I was awarded a, a grant with my with the faculty at my university, and we had the support of the author, everything. And now the publishers are saying you cannot do this study. So you know, uh, I need to know whether or not this is even like possible that they can stop us from reviewing and 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 analyzing if there are cultural linguistic differences. Yeah, I, I think this is something that you will probably have to go to legal, but I would imagine that uh, you can get uh, information. I think you could publish, I mean, the results. And uh, I don't see how they could stop you from publications. One of the few things we have as academicians is that, you know, there's supposedly no type of contract that, uh, that that this allows us from publication unless it's specified in the funding. But to my understanding, that should not be the case. Um, and I would check with you the legal department in your university, because I mean, we've been able to publish it. We send it out, we publish it. I mean, we have yet, I've been many years in academia. Um, <laughs> I still haven't been uh, sued yet, but who knows? Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit more scary when you're just starting in your career, yeah, but yeah. it's it's just very incredible that the publisher will say, you know, even though there are already data that suggest this is a measure that has huge problems, that I cannot do a comparison uh, and then a revision of that language. So, yeah, but I, uh, you know, uh, Wendy, I don't know, this is something for your uh, university to talk about. I, you know, early in my career, I had one time where I was going to, I had to go to legal. Uh, and I was very lucky that my chair, you know, said, go forward, I'll support you, Maggie. And we, we didn't end up in court, luckily, <laughs> but it really made a big difference because it really moved the, uh, something that I, I was not willing to give and, and it changed the perspective and I felt very uh, supported by my chair, as you can imagine. Right, and it talks about that systematic change that needs to occur when exactly. it comes to the exactly. Latinx population. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you might want to also, I'm sorry, you might also want to go to the Professional Association of uh, Forensic Psychologists and get their push uh, and, and then try to get, this is uh, what we were talking before about a coalition of people that would be interested in having a better uh, measure uh, for Latino um, people and making sure that the translation is correct. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Okay, so I have a quick question because like now that you are started talking about uh, your early career experiences and right after this, we're going to have a session on that. So if you can tell us a little bit about like the, the barriers, the challenges that you face earlier in your career. I think the, the, the first challenge I um, as a junior investigator was that I didn't have the funding myself, so I was supported by the funding of uh, the people I work with. So I, I was all over the place, which was absolutely fabulous. But in when people review your work, they want you to be quite narrow because it's depth rather than breadth. And my uh, initial uh, CV was, you know, I had done HIV, I, I had done uh, divorce, I had done, you know, many, many different studies of different fertility. Um, 
So I did a lot of studies. So people were like, what is this person about? Uh, she doesn't have an identity, a professional identity. So that was the first one. I think it really helped me because it gave me the perspective. Those are all topics that are related to public health. And they're all topics of uh, populations that have been marginalized. So, so it really uh, gave me a, a breath in that component that it's not one thing and that mental health, it's a very narrow way of looking at uh, what's happening to people. Uh, the second thing I would say was a challenge in my early career um, was not being taken seriously in Puerto Rico. I think when people see University of Puerto Rico, it's like you're a third level investigator. And what really helped me was the collaborations I did with so many people in the U.S. And that helped uh, elevate the type of publications and also doing collaborations so that people would see that some of the work was important, uh, even if it was on Puerto Rico. Talking about generalizability, I cannot tell you how many times people wanted the sample from Puerto Rico to be taken out because it would not be representative of the U.S. population. So that became, and then I would say thirdly, I think a challenge is uh, with the writing skills uh, and how difficult it is to, when uh, English is your second language, I would have to say, believe it or not, uh, you, I mean, you think differently, you write differently, and it, it, it became challenging, uh, especially in getting publications early on. Over time, you become better and better, but it is something that I, you know, would tell people, get an editor, try to pay someone to review what you write, so you get it published a lot faster. And then try to get as much mentoring as you can. I think I was very, very lucky. I got so many generous uh, people to help me, and that's why I have a hard time saying no. <laughs> <laughs> and then personally, what type of coping skills do you use during that? Those because um, you must have gone through a lot of frustrating moments. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, I think to be in this field, you have to be an optimist. Let me say that because the rejection is so uh, persistent uh, that you have to always think. You know. Uh, that, you know, be persistent. I tell people it's not intelligence, it's persevering, a perseverance what will make a difference between uh, climbing up the ranks, not intelligence. There are a lot of plenty of intelligence people that have been left behind. I think the, the one of the things that uh, was a coping skill is trying to identify both mentors and places that would value the work I do. I think that is so, so critical. Uh, try to go to a place. It doesn't matter Ivy League or non Ivy League or whatever. I mean, I think it was very helpful for me to go to Harvard at a time when I felt secure enough about my work and myself so that when people, uh, for example, treated me as if I was the, you know, the person that came to take me, um, I didn't feel like, well, you know, they are. Um, not treating me as faculty, but I don't feel, you know, uh, that demean. I don't take it personally. I mm -hmm. think it's cluelessness. And so that was very helpful to be secure about yourself. But it, I have to say the imposter syndrome is so, so strong in all of us. Uh, and so getting a group of people that you can network and value what you do and tell you, no, 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 Maggie, what you're doing is really valuable uh, and making sure that you're in an environment that you're supported um, is to me the only way you can survive. Thank you. Thank you for that. And one thing that we're going to be talking about you in the presentation, I wanted to know it from you is, was there a time in your life that you like, so a specific instance or a number of, of events that happened in your life that led you into the work of Healthy Spidey's, just like to lead you to the why you're doing this? Well, I mean, I think there are several things that led me to what I, I'm doing, for example, right now. I, I actually 
would say that um, I would break my career probably in three different stages. The first stage, I was just like, you know, I'm going to be a professor or whatever, an instructor. And I was not very gear or in any way uh, goal oriented. I just wanted to do good work, but I didn't care really necessarily. I was following whatever my uh, co investigators were doing. And that quickly changed when my um, my boss retired early and she was supposed to stay uh, working and then she was not hired again. And they told me, OK, you need to become the you become you need to become the, the center director. That really was a transformative moment because it changed from being more of a relaxed uh, academician to someone now in charge of trying to raise money, writing grants. It, it really changed completely. And then it also um, changed in terms of management. I, I was the youngest person in that office, but at the same time had the most responsibility in and getting older and more senior investigators to, to try to follow. It really uh, require a lot of uh, grit and require principles. I would say principles. It, it really helped me to have principles that I valued so much, like fairness and also, um, you know, integrity and making sure that what we were doing was the best. Um, but you know, it was sweat, uh, blood, sweat, and tears. Uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. I think that second stage really allowed me to build collaborations, and that's what made me, I, I think, move from uh, from something small to something bigger. It really allowed me to uh, do collaborations with people that I never thought before. And one of the things I recommend to people is the importance of networking with people you admire. Uh, and trying to see is there a way that you could do work with them because that's how I I did a lot of the early collaborations and improved my work dramatically. Uh, that's how I improved, for example, my methodological skills were quite weak and I had some of the best people, uh, Pat Shroud, uh, Daniel Freeman, Rob Givens, you know, Chow Li Meng, some of the best statisticians in the world that were willing to collaborate with me. That makes huge progress. And then the third stage is doing a lot of work where I started feeling that I was having no impact. I felt that I was writing about all of this disparities and I was talking to the wall that no one was really making a change. And I mean, I was doing this very interesting work, but it didn't change anything. And that was my third uh, stage, which has been what I need to do to have a little more impact to of the work we're doing. And that changed me into um, moving beyond the clinic to the community. It meant moving to policymakers. It meant spending more time in dissemination and spending a lot more time in actually trying to see for whom was that work uh, important and then that in itself made me think well maybe part of the problem is that's not how people see the problem let me go and see how they see the problem and co-construct the solution with them and that has been uh i think the the piece that i'm enjoying the most now thank you yeah, so someone says, like, thank you so much for sharing your personal journey. So it's encouraging. Yeah, I think that's just incredibly valuable. So I'm um, going to keep asking questions about this unless someone else sure. uh, brings sure. up. Or, or, or if you want to shift focus or, or say something different. No, no, I mean, I think one of the important things for people is to not give up. I mean, academia is so hard now, so, so hard. And Jenny, um, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing Jenny, but it is very, very, uh, the standards have been raised dramatically over the years. Uh, but at the same time, I see a moving target in a positive direction, which is, I think what will matter more and more is impact, not so much publications and grants. And it will allow for people to not necessarily 
only do research in the traditional way we have been doing it. So uh, I'm excited about that possibility. Um, I actually was part of a group that was looking into impact and how uh, people are thinking of impact very differently, not so much by citations, but actually in uh, being influencers uh, or changing a paradigm in a way that that makes for a big impact. So maybe you have three publications, but it could be that it changes how people are now doing X or Y. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And then I think that the uh, change with academic uh, community and policy partnerships are going to be the future. So I think trying to build them on early. Uh, a lot of the uh, pieces that people ask me the most are, how are you building these networks? How are you able to collaborate with people in all over? And, you know, bring people in, bring people in. Thank you. I wanted to, um, I, was I think there's, a, um, anyways, I, I think that, uh, you know, something that I was reflecting on, Matthew, that you, uh, when you were talking about your own um, mentorship, um, um, your mentorship experience, but also how you like to mentor other people, and you know myself being on the other side of that just mentorship relationship. <laughs> um, something that came to mind was, uh, you know, I'm very, I love doing research. I want to get my feet like wet immediately, and and you do a really good job at like trying to balance me. Um, you know, when I was thinking when you were talking about this, the, the three stages in your life, and how the second stage became very fast paced, and you. You know, the, the conversation that we had uh, privately said, like, Jenny, once you get your R01, this does not stop, Jenny. Like, you, why don't you consider something a little bit like a K so you have a little bit more time to develop your skills? Because once you get an R01, it is non stop, non stop. So I think that's like, it's a balancing act. Um, and I appreciate um, being on the other side of this uh, mentorship relationship because it's trying to balance being competitive enough and being meeting the demands of academia and Harvard, no less, right? And uh, and also trying to have a mentor who's also trying to pace you where you don't get burnt out by the time you're forty. <laughs> so I don't know. It's uh, it's been it's been an interesting experience, and it's, I think. Um, I think it's a, it's a difficult. Uh, it's a difficult place to be to be mentoring someone. I, mean, I think in, at, at my stage of career, where I want to, where I have to do a lot, but not too much. Where I like, can't do more. Yeah, but Jenny, I love you know mentoring you because you're so dedicated and so committed. I mean, one of the things in mentoring that I think is so um, inspiring. Uh, it's difficult because sometimes you want to make sure that the person is not burning out like you're saying and at the same time you want them to be productive and and different people have different trajectories not everyone can um jump in and 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 move on uh but i think the the really great thing about mentoring is you get to see people thrive in a way it's like I mean, I use my children, but I, I really feel like you see these people where they started and where they go. And then you see, wow, you know, that that's, you know, such a fulfilling thing. Um, so it, it keeps you inspired to, to do it more and more. And it's such an enjoyable you learn. I, I mean, I always say this. I always, always learn from more from my mentees that that they learn from me. I'll, uh, hundred percent of the time so so i always benefit so much from you know the new ideas and how people think differently and so it's a, a very enriching you know trajectory thank you let's see oh there are a few more questions yes jomaira she, she's asking hello the panel has been fantastic i had a question how do you start a community-based intervention like this is it important to get community members' perspective? But how do you know that a community has an issue in the first place and make that first step from your position sure. in academia? Yeah, I, I really, the way that we have identified um, issues in the community actually has been, uh, it has come up, someone has mentioned like in meetings. Let me, let me tell you an example. Uh, 
I was in a meeting with a friend of mine that was a psychiatrist to the school system, and she used to do um, when there were crises in schools, and she was telling me, oh my God, these two schools have this terrible problem of violence, and um, I get um, asked all the time to go there and consult for the schools. And I said, oh, well, we're very interested in doing something in the school setting. Uh, why don't we go and talk to the schools? And it was really interesting because then we talked to the community and to the schools and uh, talked also to the, um, they, they were saying, the school was saying that the problem was the problem with uh, the education department not doing enough for the kids and the uh, education department saying that teachers were doing a terrible job. So no one had a one definition of what was happening. We went in and did our own definition of the problem with the school, with the teachers, the students, and came up with a very different definition. So we decided that the community needed to be the education, the teacher, the principal, and 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 do it all together. And we build a community based on who wanted to um, get involved, and we would help, and we would commit ourselves to working with them for three years. And that's what we did. But you have to develop the community. In other places, we have found, for example, for the photo stories, what we did is we went to youth serving organizations and ask them who would be willing to help us uh, work in this project. And we actually got around six organizations that were willing to work with us. So people can drive you. It, it takes a lot of time, however, to build this community relationship. That's what I would say. And then you have to commit that it's not gonna be a one-shot deal, that it's gonna be more long-term. Thank you. And we have a question from Dana. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you, Dana. <laughs> Sorry, I I have another question. Don't mean to to hog the. No, no, no. Here. I just was wondering if you can talk a little bit about. Um, we've been having a lot of internal discussions at UIC about this, about how we can kind of hold our academic departments, institutions, kind of more accountable for structural racism, implicit bias. I think, you know, we see this in P&T processes, but we also see this in hiring. We see this in microaggressions and meetings. Um, and also just the kind of the quote unquote respect that more community engaged disparities work um, receives within our departments. Can you like maybe give some advice of how you've handled yeah. that or how you've navigated that across your career? So, uh, Dana, that is a superb question and i'm going to tell you uh the frustration and the uh advance so uh first this is an area that i really really recommend uh given your position to get again a group of faculty uh, i have at this age at this stage of my career i have the luxury of actually being able to be very vocal uh, because if they throw me out, they throw me out. But I mean, it's at the, you know, at the later stages of my career, so I could be quite blunt. So one, uh, they, uh, in my hospital, let me give you an example, is putting together uh, anti-racist uh, movement, which is really, really great. It's the first time we're going to do it. Uh, however, I had some very strong opinions about the importance of using evidence. Uh, of anti-racism that works. So what I did is I actually, uh, in 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 presenting to when they were asking about what we thought about it, I was very vocal in saying like I think it's really important to have a logic model. I think it's important to use the evidence of uh, programs that have worked. I think we have to not be focused only on education because there's a lot of policies that are actually not working. And I have I have to um, say that the young people have been very receptive to that, and actually uh, asked me if I could go and talk upper uh, groups, and that has worked really well. So we sent some materials, we created some other additional. So I think it's hard to uh, people start getting very very uh, scared. One of my mentees, for example, she was doing a disparities uh, thing, in, in, and she 
she had issues. So what I said is, let me go with you to every meeting that you have to support you. Because I can voice things that, you know, or I can um, be, be, be a, uh, make sure that I have your back if something happens and I can take it to the higher level. So I think it's very important to try to identify, Dana, who are people that your allies that have higher positions that could work with you. Second, sometimes, you know, uh, I didn't, I have never done this, but I know people that have written an op-ed <laughs> about the injustices in an institution as a way to bring, you know, light. And sometimes you have to, to play um, a strong part to get heard. So, but I would really not recommend junior people to take that role, but actually to ally themselves with people that have senior positions and that feel more comfortable in voicing those uh, accountability issues. Great, thank you. Yeah, okay, so we have a break for the next presentation, which is going to, going to start at one. Uh, I'm sorry, it's 12. <laughs> we only have four minutes to break. But uh, but yeah, but this was amazing. So I, I just want to thank you so much for showing us today. This was incredibly valuable. Um, so are there any last thoughts or any final message you want to give? No. Yeah. To, to thank people for being so... Um... You know, this was a lot of information and it's hard to, again, having the cognitive bandwidth, uh, but luckily it's audio tape and, and that people have it. And if people have questions or whatever, feel free to contact me. Um, I, I'm very grateful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, okay, everybody. So we're going to go into a break of uh, three minutes and then we're going to be back at 12. With the presentation is how to start a career in, in healthcare disparities and the presenters will be dr shenny sanduan who is a research fellow at mass general hospital at harvard medical school colin hensley dr colin hensley <laughs> there she is who is a resident now and she graduated from the university of cincinnati and i will be joining you in the session too so i'll see you in a few minutes thank you